know what really makes us mad? Is wasting money on CDs with only one or two good songs. Yeah. Talk about punk! What's up, posers? Welcome to Punk Lotto Pod. I'm your co-host, Justin Hensley. I'm your other co-host, Dylan Hensley. And this is the show where we choose one year at random and select one punk, hardcore, emo, or punk adjacent album from that year to discuss. This is our first episode recorded after a week off for Thanksgiving. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying this now, because it's going to come out two weeks after Thanksgiving when it actually (laughs) goes up. But anyway, we're a little rusty. Plus, I am now free from the shackles of the overnight work shift and now am going to begin my day shift this week. So things are looking up in the punk lotto world. And if you want to hear more about the, uh, the punk lotto extended universe, uh, you can head over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash punk lotto pod for $1. You get access to all of our weekly bonus audio. And what did we talk about last week? We did. And I'm listening uh, where we go through our last FM uh, <laughs> charts yeah. uh, for the last month, basically, and talk about the records that we've listened to. Yeah, these have, uh, is kind of a staple of our uh, Patreon bonus content. It, it might be like the is it the first idea we had that wasn't a chart dive for the Patreon? It was probably, yeah, it's probably the first other thing we did it was like, yeah, let's do our five by fives. We were doing five by fives originally. Because yeah, that was the trend at the time, <laughs> which five by fives have gone down. People don't use them, do them super consistently because I think everyone realizes that they don't have enough different stuff on their five by fives. Yeah. 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 I noticed it stopped being five by fives. It started to be more like four by fours and some like Sometimes three by three by threes. <laughs> <laughs> I was in that camp, too. I couldn't do it every week. And. And then I'm I'm also this like I can't I can't share my five by fives like it's gonna spoil the I'm listenings for the future nobody cares nobody cares that <laughs> nobody's gonna remember wait a minute <laughs> I already know he listened to that album <laughs> and Saw or it just... on his five by five two weeks ago <laughs> yeah right or this just like I can't wait for them to talk about this album and then I don't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. The fun stuff. Uh, Patreon.com. If anyone, if anyone sees your five by five and really wants to know what you think of a record, they're just going to ask. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. When they just ask it. me. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm not keeping it. Well, you'll have to subscribe to find out, you know. <laughs> That'll be a dollar. <laughs> uh, this is also, I guess, the first recording we've done since your band's new EP was officially released to the world. Yeah. Um, major awards it's a good night to have a bad time it's the great taste of mcdonald's <laughs> <laughs> is that what the names are referenced to <laughs> no no <laughs> I, I just have realized it recently i was like oh, that sounds like a jingle <laughs> oh yeah it's the mcdonald's one <laughs> good time for the great taste of mcdonald's <laughs> um no it's actually I was actually thinking along the lines of um, Born Under a Bad Sign, Mm. the album um, and phrase. I was just kind of like toying with that phrase and expanded it into something else that I felt was thematic because we grouped these songs together to be together. I mean, it's all the trumpet songs. We put the two weirdo songs on their own single and then we put the dad rock songs on their EP together. So that's the two sides of major awards. <laughs> <laughs> we'll group the songs differently just based on uh, what they are. But uh, so, the, yeah, these are all the ones with the with trumpet on them. And Josh plays the baritone on on um, at least one song in this EP. But it, they they all felt like they fit together, like sonically, they felt like they fit together more so than the other songs, though. I don't think that any like I don't think anything is like too wildly out there but we just kind of they're more like the single those songs are more complex there's more parts they're almost written more like hardcore songs in terms of like here's a riff here's a riff like that's kind (laughs) of like how those songs are structured and then these are like it's just a verse and a chorus it's a verse and a chorus maybe a bridge you know like it 
you know, some songs being slightly more progressive in structure and, you know, some songs having more of a substantial bridge or uh, or like a bridge and a solo or something like that, like in terms of song structure. But it, they're still rooted in like what I would call like songwriter verse chorus structure and like and that kind of to me that that puts those these songs together. But realized kind of that I had like had kind of created a theme, a, a nocturnal theme of like most of the songs kind of take place at night not that they're necessarily story songs i think of them more as character study and thematic songs as far as the way that i incorporate narrative but but yeah there's definitely like references to night and like they all kind of have like a downward looking you know emotional bent i guess but so yeah i thought i could say something with the title that is not a phrase anywhere on in any of the songs is not the name of any of the songs that gives it kind of like a this is a substantial work even though it's an ep and you know these songs belong together not just because we play them or write and not just because we wrote them but because they like really do belong together they're interlocked in some other way it's kind of my thinking but yeah that's out there uh check it out major awards band on instagram and twitter and i think we're just major awards on tiktok i want to say the band camp is major awards band no it's just major awards.bandcamp.com don't have my username synchronicity because i think major awards is taken on a couple of other like just major awards is taken on instagram and twitter probably uh should check on those see if i can get those handles <laughs> but i don't know the links are all out there yeah. I would say Google it, but we're in the category of difficult to Google band names. So <laughs> do the band name and the, the EP title and you'll find it. Yeah, and I'll include a link to that in the show notes as well. So this week it was your turn to be assigned the year and to choose the album from the year. So I was looking through, I was like, well, we haven't done the 2000s in a minute. So I was like, well, what have we not covered? And it, I think it was June of last year was the last time that we did this year, and that is 2007. So you know, a little over a year. Pretty good little clip there. We haven't repeated too often, but as usual, we like to take a look at the other albums that came out that year that uh, kind of get a feel for what's going on. Before we get into the charts or anything like that, though, you sent me actually quite a few options when I gave you the year. And your thoughts were this year's kind of bad question mark. Yeah. So 2007, I was 17. I was very into music. Um, I was playing in a metalcore band and listening to music constantly and constantly discovering new music. And like, this is kind of like, this is more on the message board download thread era, not mm-hmm. quite getting the block spot era, but, there's a little overlap getting in getting into the blog spot era of music discovery and yeah definitely looking through magazines as often as we could and and spending a lot of time online and the online the online there was nowhere very, else to be very tumblr.com days no we're too early too early too for early tumblr. for tumblr so we're still like, like 2008 myspace yeah. into facebook era period yeah. right still myspace still very much just yeah. myspace in terms of like social media you might have had facebook by then but that was that was before it was open to everyone yeah i i think i got a facebook in like 2006 because my friend in college was like i'm just gonna make you an account and it's there whenever you're ready because i was actually really resistant to it because i was like i'm already on myspace i don't need facebook like yeah like why, why do i want a smaller field of people to like you know to interact with i think I liked my spaces like you could embed shit and like, you know, the customization ability that MySpace had. And so I was very resistant to getting Facebook. And uh, my, like I said, my friend Sarah at the time, she was like, I made you an account. What do you want your password to be? And like, <laughs> like she made me get one. And uh, and then eventually like it over, you know, it overtook my space. So she was right to get me in there. She's like, this is going to be more popular. So use it. Uh, she lives in Japan now. Really, very cool. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a year that I remember very well. I definitely remember a ton of this of stuff that came out. We definitely 
look at the charts proper. But in terms of like what I considered, like I really wasn't seeing a lot that I was that thrilled about or like that I would want to talk about. I did send you quite a few and they were like, but honestly, none of the ones I sent you, I was even like very close to being tipped over. You know, like the scales were just kind of teetering on on some of these like it was and it was weird like it was like the stuff that i was considering i pulled mongrel by the number 12 looks like you (laughs) (laughs) so my initial reaction to like the first batch of things you sent me i was like what what is he doing like what what is the angle like what is these are odd choices for you especially like these yeah are like what are you picking well so i think it kind of i definitely wanted to find less obvious choices and i was definitely looking for weirder choices that i could talk about from this year so that <laughs> very Dylan, much explains number 12 Dylan is uh, afraid of success and will do everything to choose something that will not be popular to wow. <laughs> talk about on the, for the right. podcast. <laughs> but in fairness, me in 2007 was like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I didn't I don't think I listened to that number 12 looks like you record then, but probably shortly after, probably in like 2008. I, and like. So I I considered that one because that's a band that I didn't think that I liked because my first impressions of them was hearing some of their early stuff on the Barnes and Noble listening stations in the media department when you had the headphones. Such an so many bands. (laughs) Yeah, this is a weird one. But like so many bands I heard for the first time on that. On those headphones in the Barnes and Noble, you would either go find the CD in the store and scan it and be like, what's this? Because you're like, I've seen this name in magazines. Let me see what it sounds like. Or you could like search bands on it. So like we would do that with bands in magazines Mm -hmm. that we would like see the album. I was like, let's see what they sound like. And I think I probably heard something from Nuclear Said Nuclear or whatever that record's called. Like one of the first couple number 12 looks like you records. I was like, I don't like this. Like this doesn't appeal to me. And then I heard something from Mongrel later. I don't know where I came across it. I was like, I'm very interested in that. And that was definitely in my listening to, like, you know, Between the Berry to Me and shit like that, like, <laughs> all the time. So, yeah, your technical progressive metalcore, mathcore stuff. <laughs> that, was in my, that was in my wheelhouse back then. So Whew. I thought that could be an interesting one to listen to and talk about. And I think it is one that would hold up relatively well from what I remember of it. But again, not it didn't really push me over. I considered Risk Revival by Hot Cross. That was definitely one that was much higher in my consideration. I do think that's a good record and that is something i discovered around that time period of course like right after they broke up i'm sure which was always the case does does hot cross feel like a forgotten band at this forgotten. point yeah like they were i feel like they're really big and really like i mean if you were listening to this particular like style of music like they're very well regarded critically acclaimed well regarded people talked about them a lot they had a budget like this was like during that period where the style of music actually had a little bit of like good recording quality behind it i think hot cross was on the cusp of being like an alexis on fire yeah yeah kind of band like they almost could have broken to that level off of this record but they were still playing like basement screamo shows so yeah i bought a hot cross shirt from shirt killer like when i was a freshman in college (laughs) <laughs> and I would wear it all the time. And most of the people at my small Christian college would be like, what, like hot cross buns? Yes, I learned it on the recorder. I'll <laughs> play it for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's jingle uh, bells. <laughs> <laughs> but and like, I think I think a guy when I got my first tattoo, a guy at the tattoo shop. I wore that shirt then. And the guy was like, oh, did you see them when they played here? It's like, no. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, because that would have been Asheville. And Asheville, like, everyone played there. Like, that's, like, the one cool thing about Asheville. At least during that era, like, every subgenre band played there. Like, yeah. Very popular stop. Almost all house shows. Like, almost everything. It's, like, a very a network of house shows that existed in Asheville during that period. And now I don't think it's really like that anymore. Another uh, time period specific memory that I distinctly have attached to hot cross is that I remember downloading this record for the first time while we were at the beach, that, <laughs> that, that, un, that sweet, sweet Wi-Fi, reliable <laughs> Wi-Fi. Cause that would have been the time period where we were stealing our neighbor's Wi-Fi cause he was never home and didn't realize that we were downloading a shit ton of music on his Wi-Fi. <laughs> cause he was an underwater welder and, yeah. uh, he for nuclear leave, reactors. Yeah, he would like leave town for like weeks at a time, like staying in a place, working on a nucle- underwater nuclear reactor, welding it. Leave. This is also before like everybody's Wi-Fi had passwords. Like this is definitely yeah. like people just were like letting that shit go, and we were just like siphoning the shit out of his <laughs> his Wi-Fi. He was close enough that we could. Yeah, the or signal just, was just strong enough. Yeah, stealing Wi-Fi. Because our parents wouldn't pay for Wi-Fi. They were still on dial-up at that point. Yeah. Like, they weren't even... This is when everybody else was already on DSL. Like, our parents were still on dial-up. Uh, I threw a new beat from Dead Heart on, uh, 108, by 108 on here. I was like, I I could dig that. I could talk about that. I could listen to that. I didn't know how much I could talk about it. That's why I ended up passing on that one. Um, yeah. One of weeks, like we're a really cool band, but like also like, yeah, I don't know their discography well enough to know that if I'd be able to really talk about it for extended period of time. Uh, I considered feast or famine by Chuck Reagan. Cause I thought that's an interesting variation on the kind of stuff that we cover. Uh, a bit of a nostalgia listen. It's one that I know, and I thought there might be something to talk about in like that whole Chuck Reagan, Gaslight, and you know Brian Fallon. Uh, what's the acoustic tour that they did with like all, the, all of the guys? The revival uh, tour. The revival tour. It's like that could be something to talk about, and that could be something to talk about in the future. I'm not ruling out ever talking about a solo Chuck Reagan record in the future, but. This that was one of the stronger contenders in terms of what I was considering talking about. I threw "Prepare to Be Let Down" by Ruiner on there. I thought that would be an interesting one to revisit because I loved that record. A long time ago, very uh, it was hyped a, band. Yeah, uh, it was a very influential band on me as a hardcore vocalist. Once we switched to just being a, a hardcore band uh, <laughs> with the guys from our old metalcore band. Yeah. Uh, and I threw Queer Salutations by Teenage Cool Kids on there because I, I would have been interested in revisiting that one. You can't marry that that won't come back to life it's definitely my favorite record by them, and I was always eternally bummed every time I hear Parquet Courts, and I go like, "Teenage Teenage Cool Kids were so much better." Yeah, it wasn't. It's not as good. Same goes for Daniel Stripe Tiger. That was, that was very, but yeah, that was a very college record for me. I listened to that a lot in college. Now, if we were going to try and actually pick some popular records that people would possibly know, uh, we could have talked about stuff we've already talked about. Uh, <laughs> This is the same year as AJJ's People Who Can Eat People Are the Luckiest People in the World. This is my introduction to AJJ. Uh, Paramore's Riot, which we actually did do an episode on. I just saw a TikTok of someone talking about overrated records uh, where he mentioned We Were Dead Before the Ship Even Sank by Modest Mouse. And I was really wondering where he was getting the overrating from because I don't know that people loved that record. That's the one with Johnny Marr. 
like that, I guess I think that like it gave them a different mm-hmm. cred than like the Modest Mouse fans weren't the ones who were really talking about their record. I think it was just the Johnny Marr fans being like, oh, Johnny Marr. Yeah. <laughs> on the Modest Ma- on the radio rock band Modest Mouse new album. I like I specifically remember that one not being well received. Yeah. Well, uh, we, especially because they'd already hit like mainstream popularity with the previous record. So it's like this weird like, oops, we shed our original bass by going mainstream ish. They didn't really ever change their sound, though. So like, I think Modest Mouse fans stuck with them more than some other bands who got bigger. It was a little more in the post punk revival vein, though. Yeah. Uh, we could talk about we could talk about Ireworks by Dillinger Escape Plan. Yeah, we could. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how I felt. I was like, that's a big record. I listened yeah. to it then. So I, <laughs> I have those memories of it. Uh, Cohen and Cambria did No World for Tomorrow, which was the second good Apollo record, which is the first record they put out where I was like, I don't like this as much. Like, it was the first one where I was like, I definitely like everything else before this better. <laughs> a trend that would continue, I guess, somewhat. But yeah, you yeah, could do Circus Survive on Letting Go. I mean, yeah, this is a weird year i mean like there's big stuff like fallout boy of course like but uh, i really do not like i will never select a fallout boy record no it, if we ever cover fallout boy it means we have a guest who chose it because yeah. i am not going to willingly choose a record by that band don't like them uh <laughs> never have never will uh against me's new wave that that's a big record that's that's a big album uh that was also like a look at these sellouts uh <laughs> album <laughs> people were so mad at them and then they were like jokes on the label we just took their money and ran <laughs> i don't know that the label was gonna like resign them anyway but yeah they got dropped <laughs> <laughs> more than likely yeah 2007 I, I it's interesting here it's a lot of things that i like i don't even really like recognize these albums in particular i'm like that hives album i don't remember i don't even remember that coming out I guess if I look at like my personal listening stuff, I don't know. There, yeah, 2007 would not be like one of my big years for sure. I think in 07 we were actively seeking out new music or like different music or different bands because the bands that we were like already into were putting out stuff that like we didn't love as much, and then like stuff that I would get into later that I would wind up loving, but not so much like from that year during that year like a record um like a record like deliver us by darkest hour like yeah it's not really anything special about it there's nothing to really say about it that isn't just i'm talking about darkest hour in general and i'm just talking about darkest hour in general i'll talk about hidden hands or i'll talk (laughs) about undoing ruin like i'm going to talk about one of the bigger records not that deliver us is a bad record there's just actually kind of well-regarded one of their more well-regarded records but there's just something about when it came out and when i heard it and how i was kind of like not as into it as the previous record it was just it's just a it's a weird time it's a weird time it's a it's a transition period i feel like too like we are exiting metalcore as being like kind of like the big subgenre current wave and then we're about to enter the more like Death Wish inspired stuff being big. And then we're still in this period where like heavy music is bigger than more melodic stuff, unless you're like mega famous, like the Fallout Boys and the against I mean, like the mega star bands. So, but like with the AJJ and then like their Lemuria put out the first collection in 2007, I think we're getting our seeds for indie punk going forward too. This, this time period is so interesting to me like you said metal like heavy stuff being more popular than more melodic stuff like that really was true it was a really there's not a good comparison to make culturally to how big metalcore and hardcore and screamo like those genres those sounds the descriptors were because i don't think that it, it's interesting to me what has held on from like the scene emo mall core kind of like world uh in the the warp tour world and like all of that whole big galaxy of punk stuff ultimately having such a big cultural moment 
because we've really held on to just the most commercial stuff, like the, your My Chemical Romance, your Fallout Boy. That stuff has stuck around culturally and had like the reunion shows and and stuff like that that people have been into, and that's what the Zoomers have gotten into, like your TikTok scene revival kids are into. And it's so it's hard to really make a comparison to how big something like job for a cowboy is from this time period. That kind <laughs> of like death core shit being so huge. Like see in our, like our podunk little town in North Carolina, like not even suburbs, like you would call it probably call it exurbs, you know, the closest city, big city, you know, top 50 city is like, a top 25 uh, population city in the United States. So the, the far outskirts of that kind of city where you have kids going to the mall in full all over print, five color fucking metal core shirts. Yeah. Yeah. And skate shoes and studded belts that, that huge, like that to me, I don't know what to compare that to other than is maybe hair metal. It wasn't quite hair metal big in terms of dollar amounts, ticket sales. You know, these bands weren't like arena level, but it was such a big youth culture moment that since then I haven't seen, I haven't really seen anything like that for such n- really niche music. Ultimately something that has such little radio appeal commercial appeal I maybe mean, maybe we're in in it now with callous dowboy being in a fucking <laughs> truck commercial or something like that i don't know we're getting close to that I level guess too, again it's also worth noting that metal may was big during this time period too like metal was huge and the type of people i know who were primarily like punk and hardcore music listeners during this time period we're seeing metal bands live still yeah. like this is brown pants metal to the max period. Like there's a Rosetta record this yeah. year. There's a neurosis record. The red album by Baroness is this year. Like this is metal has a musical critical uh, stranglehold that like, it doesn't really have normally like it's the kind of metal that like, Oh, it does get reviewed in like these well-regarded magazines and websites, you know? So like, it's, it's weird. A, also a period where, uh, outspokenly racist metal bands are <laughs> are popular we're popular and not getting a uh, very at all any pushback from any kind of press or anyone yeah um but, yeah to the to the point where like they just kind of like snuck it in it's like people just like didn't know that they were racist and like i try and i'm trying to look at like my i have a list of albums that i've like listened to over the years and like i'm looking at 2007 specifically and i'm like if you try to narrow it down into the more orgcore, not quite fest punk at this point, everyone wasn't going yet in 2007 yet. The but even like fat epifat sound, we're in like Side a one. we're in we're in a post Rock Against Bush era, which was kind of like the end of the epifat like dominance. And we've now shifted to the Paramours and Fallout Boys being like the biggest like pop punk bands in the world. So it's very warp Tory. It's very side one dummy during this period. And I'm like, who else? Who else? Who the other labels uh, who had big like post hardcore and equal vision, equal vision. Victory Records is a thing. Victory. Yeah. All the metalcore labels are a thing like, yeah, punk is in a weird like just like melodic punk rock is in a weird spot that will blow up again in like a year or two. But it, it's it's also this is I don't think there's since then. and Maybe there's just not enough time. There's just there has not been nearly as many labels releasing records by such like deeply entrenched subgenre bands as we're dealing. We're seeing at this time period that are like hitting in cap displays and in Best Buy. And these are independent labels that are building such a high value catalog that it was worth selling 
to UMG or Sony or whoever bought up all of those, like, you know, all the, the, the ferrets and all of those labels, the, you know, the, the tooth and nail solid state back catalogs, you know, all of that stuff getting sold off. There's I, I, no one's at that level. Like if they're, we've had our, like our little pop punk thing, but like those are the only ones that are doing the big, big, big numbers are the ones who had money to begin with. It's machine gun Kelly and Avril Lavigne. And, you know, like nobody's, nobody's that big. Maybe they are now, maybe we're getting close to some of that stuff, but yeah. Well, let's get into the actual album you did select for us to talk about because you definitely chose something that is not popular or no. <laughs> was not trying to be popular either. Like there's definitely a we'll get into it. Very uh independent spirit in this record. So, I gave you the year 2007 and you selected the complete unfinished works of the Young Tigers by Bader Brains. The autopsy begins. Released on Clean Plate Records, Waking Records, and Empire Records. Empire with a Y. The person on this album is Sarah Kirsch on guitar and vocals, and Jose Palafox on drums. Sarah Kirsch was part of the bands Fuel, Pinhead Gunpowder, Sawhorse, John Henry West, Navia Forge, Torches to Rome, Bread and Circuits, Please Inform the Captain This is a Hijack, Mother Country Motherfuckers, and like, there's like more too. Like, just lesser known bands too but like a lot more and then jose palifax was also in the band swing kids bread and circuits and yafet kodo so like this is the lane of of art of music that we are occupying if you look at the very specific discogs page for this record it's like the third one down when you're looking at it it also lists a lot more artists but it's like this (laughs) it's weird so this the way it's credited band the founding mem the founding family members and other parentheses literary tricks slash meridian redirection slash hain goshi by kyle 487 dash r aka hidden fortress slash gallbladder 39 we have Oral history sg number 051716 poopy loops and kakak so by kyle 465 dash t aka white magic and andrew m Royd. we have uh on other pb number 716235 volatile mixtures and plasma by jason 22 tx4 aka cholima slash new morning sun <laughs> We have Sound Escapade slash Remote Psychotronic slash Plastic Sweat and Cat Gut by Jason 22 RX1, aka Crisco Thunder slash Cornelius VSD. We have the Stock Footage slash Meta Mind Circuit Medium slash Lizard Brain by Kyle 427 L, aka Paul Pot a slash The Silicon Princer. We have Percussion and Conceptual Analysis slash Silent Slippers by Kyle 46. 486-T, a.k.a. The Red Fox slash The Worm slash Philip. 
<laughs> and the album was executive produced by Alpha Centauri International and uh, produced by the band as well as recorded by Aaron Prelwitz. So Aaron Prelwitz is a name I did not actually look up. Engineer at Tiny Telephone Studios and Hyde Street Studios in San Francisco. Worked. Oh, cool. Credited. Oh, that's cool. He has a credit on the Donna's Turn 21. Um, and then he's a credit on one song on Neil Young's Are You Passionate? Going Home. He's got a Hella credit, uh, credit, a Bratmobile credit. So definitely someone who has done some stuff engineering wise. So my guess is just wherever they went and recorded. Oh, a credit on Transatlanticism by Death Cab for Cutie. So this this uh, recording engineer has uh, done, worked with a lot of people. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's the kind of band we're dealing with here. Uh, Crisco Thunder has uh, whoever Crisco Thunder is, has released music under the name Crisco Thunder. Yes. Um, a couple of EPs, I think. I mean, it's like, I don't, I don't even know what to call it. <laughs> <It's just laughs> Agit pop. Yeah. Is one of the tags that they use. Yeah. So ultimately, it comes down to, I think it's still just Sarah Kirsch and Jose Palafox doing everything. Most, Unless some yeah. of those other people are like the ones making the beats. And this was like their weird, funny way of like coming up with names for them. But I think Sarah Kirsch is just doing the beats because Sarah Kirsch was in Bread and Circuits and Please Inform the Cabinets of the Hijack, as well as Mother Country Motherfuckers. And all three of those bands use these like plunderphonic sample style col- sound collage things. And she's the only like consistent member across every single one of those bands. So I think Sarah yeah. just doing all the beats and they just were like, we have three AKAs doing the same <laughs> mix in the <laughs> liner notes. Let's put a bunch of fake. <laughs> yeah. There, yeah. There's a third member credited for the band, but I think it's just live live bass player. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think they have like an actual like, input on the writing or recording so okay first thing first things first what made you choose beta brains for us to talk about so i was going and going through the charts and i hit that one after just kind of like scrolling for a while and just going like yeah maybe that and eh, not that maybe that and i got pretty far back and i saw that and i'm like well now i want to listen to that i know you know it and honestly my only hesitation was that it's not on streaming I was yeah. like, so I sent it to you and I was like, well, there's this. You have to listen to the LP, uh, or at least that's how I listen to it. But uh, I think you can find it on YouTube. Maybe it's on Bandcamp. Is it on Bandcamp? I it's not on Bandcamp. Uh, New Era Colonialism is on Bandcamp, which is their yeah. follow up to this one. Um, this one's not on Bandcamp. It's on YouTube as a couple different files. Um, it's also on SoundCloud. Somebody uploaded to SoundCloud. So I, okay. I listened to it on YouTube initially, and then I found the SoundCloud and I was like, oh, I listened to this here and it sounded a little better there. So, yeah, I don't I don't know. who. I think it just somebody just uploaded it. I don't think it was uh, <laughs> anybody related to the band who did it Threw it on because who's ever going to do anything with this. Right. This is right. Clean plate. <laughs> yeah, it's clean plate. Who's going to do it? Sarah Kirsch bands are pretty much all like that, uh, yeah. which is very frustrating. The only thing you can find on streaming is. The only like album you can find is the Fuel LP, mm-hmm. uh, which is like the extended version of it, the Monuments to Excess, which I think includes some other material. But yeah, it's 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 essentially their complete discography. There's no there's no Please Inform the Captain. There's no Bread and Circuits. There's no like No Tortures to Rome. No, uh, can maybe you get John some Pinhead West on there. Yeah, the Pinhead stuff that Sarah was on was like two seven inches and that's really it so they're on like this like compilation there is a compilation that has her songs on it and yeah. if you know her like you know her art like we know her work you can tell she's on them because i'm like oh those yeah. little the little those little like triplet guitars because she's playing guitar in it too wow. yeah and you're just like oh that's her yeah. uh, i think what else what else yeah there might be some is john henry might west be a john, john henry west but i even that's no that's not on there but you can get that on Bandcamp. Yeah. You get a couple of th- or things on Bandcamp, but even then, not all of her stuff's on Bandcamp either. No. It kind of depends on who else was involved with it. Can you get even Navio Forge on Spotify? No. No, you cannot Indian get Indian Summer comes up when you search for Navio Forge. Yeah. Like, all right, well, I guess I'll take Indian Summer. And Indian Summer's probably only on there now because of the uh, Numero Group reissue they just did. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Sarah Kirsch stuff is like not streamable for the most part. There's not a lot of it that you can get, especially on Spotify. Which knowing like Sarah Kirsch and like her beliefs and stances on like a lot of stuff, like that kind of makes sense too. Like I don't I bet if she was alive they would still not be on <laughs> on there. Yeah, very very possibly. It probably would be on Bandcamp. Yeah, that'd probably be where everything else would be now. At least her like because like Mother Country Motherfuckers, that's, you know, that's on Bandcamp, which, you know, the label put that out after she died. And so, yeah, she would honestly, I think she only put the stuff that she was currently releasing. <laughs> well, because like Clean Plate did this Online. record and this record's not on Clean Plate's Bandcamp. Yeah. So like they just I don't think Clean Plate has gone back and uploaded old stuff. I think they only put like stuff as it's coming out. Yeah, it's not on a band understandably it's not a priority for them to do it because they're not gonna sell it right right i don't know if you can still get can you still get copies of this from them um i don't know if you can get it directly from them anymore you can get it's never been repressed but like i also don't think it needed a repress either it's like that kind of there's there's three versions listed all 2007 uh test pressing yellow black swirl and album so maybe just a plain black i'm pretty I sure think you can still plain get black, the plain black you can still get new era hope colony i think but you can't get i don't think clean plate has any more copies of the first one while we're here well let's just mention who clean plate records is so this is a triple this is a three-way release waking records i couldn't really find much about like they released some other stuff i didn't really recognize anything Empire Records is only Sarah Kirsch bands. It's like, please inform the Captain, Bader Brains, and Mother Country motherfuckers. So I'm like, it's probably just Sarah's mock label that she, you know, she she put in money on probably to press it on vinyl. And so, like, she gets, like, a, a label logo. But Clean Plate Records is run by Will Killingsworth of Orchid fame. Yeah. So uh, Clean Plate had previously worked with Sarah on the Please Inform the Captain. This is a hijack full length. But also in 2007, they released Daniel Stripe Tiger's Capital Cities, as well as Ampere Ditro's Split and Ampere and Funeral Diner's Splits, which Will is in Ampere as well. So that makes sense. And then they would later do they would later do the follow up Beta Brains album and the Mother Country Motherfucker record. So so Clean Plate is like friends, too, on top of a well-regarded, not a huge label. They don't put a ton of stuff out, but. It's pretty much just like whatever Will is doing and like his friends that he was putting stuff out for. So, but a cool label nonetheless. Randomly, we'll put something out. Did we finish your, like, why did you choose this thought? Did we actually get all the way through that? I don't think we did. Uh, think we, so sidebarred. Enough, <laughs> we sidebarred and sidebarred and sidebarred. So I I picked this record because we've talked about Kirsch before, but I don't think we've ever talked about. We've never devoted a whole episode to no. any of her bands. I don't think we've talked about her off and on throughout the history of the show and probably talked about Fuel and maybe something else on like the 100 and 100. I don't know if we did more than one record from any of her bands but i think i did navia forge as my pick and you did fuel for yours or something like that and like 
I I didn't like I saw it and nothing was really taking all of the boxes for me. And I, I saw this and I was like, I just I instantly like I said, I instantly wanted to listen to it when I saw that it was that it came out in this year. And it's also just that time of year. I think I I I want to say that the Mother Country Motherfuckers record came out around the end of the year. Mm-hmm, it did. She died in December. Yeah, that sounds right, too. Yeah. So I I have she died. She there's a pitchfork article December 7th, uh, 2012. Yeah. And I want to say she died maybe December 5th. Yeah. She so I always think about her at this time of year. I always think about her bands at the, this time of year. I always think about her and I always think about D Boone because they both died at the end of the year. I always mm. and their the passing of their lives to me are intertwined in a way. And I think that both of those bands are hugely influential to me in different ways and in similar ways. And there's very much an ethical driving force in terms of how both of those people created art and why they made music and why they made music the way that they did. And both having such a strong, strongly anti-capitalist critical of American influence and power. And it's, I always, so I always think of them together. I, they're both artists who died too early. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, D Boone being especially like in his twenties and Sarah, I don't know how old she was. She was in bands like going back to the eighties. Yeah. Late eighties. So she kind of starts. She, and... If she wasn't in her fifties yet, she was probably in her forties when she passed away, but still too she was, young. But... She was born in, she was born in 1970. Okay. Um, yeah. But too, yeah, too early. Like, you know, the mother country motherfuckers record, like that's technically incomplete. Right. It's yeah. It's kind of like an incomplete record. It took a long time to actually finish it too, to get it put out. Um, um so yeah. she was still making records and that so like that motherfucker motherfucker <laughs> mother country motherfucker record like it rips. Oh yeah. Like it's so good. It's such an insane record to like she was making music. She was may have moving slower and certainly was not, you know, with her health in decline was moving slower, but like if she hadn't been sick and hadn't died she'd still be making records that were really good like i do not doubt that she would have continued making records that would be all timers like they would be some of the best hardcore records coming out very similarly d boone you know died way too young uh, like the alternate world that i wish we lived in where he lived because the the minuteman records that would have come out afterwards and i think even like the solo records he would have put out would be so interesting so, yeah, that's the main reason I always think about her and want to listen to her bands at this time of year. And I always want to figure it's all right. It's the right time to talk about it. And why a better brains record, better brains record the, and not any other time that I could have picked any other records from her. I just happened to see it. That's why, honestly, like and I I don't know, is is there another band that she did that is more definitive? She really has these distinct qualities that in her guitar playing in her voice in the way that she writes in the way that she designs because i'm fairly certain she did all of the design work all of the collages and stuff yeah just such a like focused driven like aesthetically focused artist uh we could talk about a brother's records record uh we could talk about you know, if if there was if there was one if I had to only pick one that I could talk about and I could never talk about any of her other bands it'd probably be Fuel. It's why I picked Fuel for the 100 and, uh, episode. But yeah, I could pick any of them. Yeah, Sarkish is hands down one of my absolute all time favorite musicians. Uh, like especially when you go like an individual singular person, not necessarily like a band or anything like that, but like she. And every band that she was involved with, they all show her talents very well, like very clearly, even when she's like not never necessarily like the creative force behind it, like the pinhead gunpowder stuff. It's Billy Joe's brand band. But and she's only on like two, seven inches by the band. But you're like, oh, I hear the backing vocals. I hear the guitar playing like I hear her style in there or even like that Colbum EP that she did was like a no idea seven inch like 
she didn't play no idea records or type punk music, you know, like it was just, but I think she was just kind of along for the ride with that project. But even then you but, hear it in her guitar playing, but not see that's the, she didn't really play no idea stuff, but like fuel, like that's, yeah, an, that's an underrated, underrepresented, very, very, very influential record for so much of the no idea sound. Like, Especially against hot me, we're looking to fuel hot water music. We're listening to fuel. Like that's an influence. A lot of the Midwestern bands, you can sense a, get a sense of fuel being an influence on on the fest punk. And that's not the kind of stuff that she made going forward. She made very extreme hardcore. <laughs> yeah. After fuel onward, but but I don't know. It's it's very. She's just very unique uh, across all of her bands. Like it, like we said, like it's just really incredible sense of dynamics and a very unique tone i think you want to say which there's nothing unique about using a jcm 800 but the way that she did uh a a really driving part of her tone is i think she played with metal picks pretty much always um so really biting really hard a lot of power in the strums and yeah a very like you said with the little triplets showing up on pinhead is like this style of guitar playing that was her own like it, you it's instantly recognizable the sense of rhythm the sense of dynamics is hers alone i, I don't hear anyone who does anything close to that like the closest and why a, a big part of what i why probably i've connected so much with her bands is like frotus gets kind of close in terms of that odd rhythm Mm -hmm. sensibility and those kinds of guitar riffs and like the like the intensity of everything Uh, i mean Mm. fugazi too like fugazi uh, the joke was the band was called fuel gazi by fans just because they were like they were doing a vein as a similar vein of music like definitely like repeater type fugazi material like that triplet guitar thing it fugazi does it too so you can't you can't just like i i fully believe fuel was inspired by fugazi they were definitely influenced by fugazi and so like that's, that's probably like a the biggest influence on their early sound but they did it in such a unique and different way like there's like a whereas fugazi can be kind of like cool like chilly and like sometimes they do like these grooves and like these laid back moments like fuel was this like non-stop just pummeling of of like speed like fuel never fugazi slowed down fuel Fuel sped up. Like, that's the difference between, like, kind of, like, the yeah. directions that those sounds went. And then, like, every band she did after that. Well, not every band. So, Navio Forge is a very specific band that's doing a specific, like, thing. It's a slower record, like, that that, that band did. And I feel like that's... It, it's her it's her band as much as it is uh, the vocalist's band because it was like a, a band that only performed twice live because it was too emotional for the lead singer Sean Linwood. So it was like equally as much his band. So, yeah, that's why that record sounds so different. But once you get into Torches to Rome, Bread and Circuits, Please Inform the Captain, this is the hijack, Beta Brains, playing fast is the goal and playing faster. And like there's just this with this record, you get it. But it's just this like never ending kind of like barrage. And then the few moments that it's taking where it's like, all right, now we're going to do this little part where it's just kind of like a little palm muted thing. And it's or like a soft or like just like a more spread out kind of like dent, 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 dent part of the song. All you know is that they're just now coiling back up to explode again. Like it's every softer, quote unquote, or like less fast parts of their songs is just building up to then explode again in whatever the next thing they're going to do. Chorus or bridge or, you know, so like the moments between the like songs, like your 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 samples and your and your um, what do we. What do we call these things? Like it's it's the I say plunder phonics because that's like the genre of like rap that like uses yeah. a lot of that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, you take samples and you just kind of like mash them all together. These beats, they're kind of like beats for the most part, but they're not like rap beats. They're like soundscapes, just like taking clips from movies and like funk music or soul music or gospel music. 
and then just like putting like these like record audio recordings of like people giving speeches or like dialogue scenes from movies and yeah they place all of these between the songs so it's very much a here's our sample here's our song here's our sample here's our song like it's just like a the moments to take a breather or relax are on the like ooh, this exploitation film that they're borrowing samples from yeah. uh, is uh yeah <laughs> is our moment to catch your breath because then they're going to turn right around and then give you like year zero or body of the king or like be seeing you at camp delta like just the it's a it's two types of music on this record and it's like a 21 minute album it's short it's short record um yeah but it doesn't need to be longer no it it's perfect length it's it's such a satisfying listen and you can you know you can just move on to all our other bands like if you want to keep going but it's just <sighs> yeah i you can get so much out of 20 minutes and like half of that time is like actual songs and the samples and the the soundscape collage sample stuff like sound collage that's what seem, i'm thinking of yeah see like it it seems like the skippable interlude type material mm-hmm. but it but it treats it as just as important as the songs because it expands on what the songs are, are about in a little more easier to it access ways while giving it also this layer of you get your kind of science fiction layer too because there's this very like science fictiony bent to all of the lyrics and the presentation of the band and it's like this like dystopian you know kind of uh you know and rebellious uh you know the young tigers are kind of like a an organization uh mm-hmm. what would be called a terrorist group uh my <laughs> whoever they're against but which is like the the dystopian sci-fi narrative construction around what are the the truly held leftist anti-capitalist beliefs of the artists and it's just exploring that in a different context in a way that's really fun um also a big similarity to frodus actually like Mm -hmm. this man's really were but not talked about most people don't talk about both of these bands doing no, very similar no. things. Uh, Maybe it's the coastal difference. Like, you know, one's on the East Coast, one's on the West Coast. Maybe that's part of it. Then Furtis was done in the 90s and and she was doing these bands more in the 2000s. But yeah, because Bread and Circuits was a little more. Bread and Circuits was close. But Bread and Circuits is like the first time where you're like, where those those sound collages are being introduced, but it's not as strong like it's not as like dominant on that yeah. record as it is so like torches to rome it's like oh this is the sound i want to do this is yeah you take that torches to rome hardcore style hardcore slash whatever screw, hardcore slash post hardcore slash screamo like sound that she's got going on emo core roots like a lot of the emo core stuff kind of like fell by the wayside in the earlier 90s but so she drifted into this like really fast style of hardcore torches the realm is like all right i figured out the music side of it and then bread and circuits is like the first time where it's like we're playing around with the sound collages like that's that's going on here i think magdalena from yafet kodos and bread and circuits too yeah so it's a little bit like half yafet half sarah kirsch um then please inform the captain i don't think sarah does the main vocals in that band i think they have a different vocalist in that group and that band is like more sound collage than hardcore like the the sound collages and please inform the captain are like the dominant sound of that record so really beta brains is the first equal mixture i think bread and circuits is more hardcore music than samples please inform the captain is more samples than hardcore music and beta brains is like the the platonic ideal of those two sounds, I guess, like combined together. It's just like, it's like a 50, 50 with beta brains than it is. So I think beta brains is probably the more representative of her post nineties direction and creative fulfillment. So I think it's, a, this is a good example to be like, here, start here, whatever sound you like more than I can guide you to that. But this is who she was as far as like an artist and the type of artwork that she was putting out on top of like everything about this band was thought about. the 
last battle will have a most unusual way of dying. of this band was meticulously thought out. You got the songs? Yeah, you got that's obvious. You got to think about that kind of stuff to get the songs there. The the sound collages, you got to you got to think about it to get that there. The packaging, like all of the records were like always filled with like accoutrement. Like there's just like these extra things like pamphlets in there. Yeah, flyers. My um very fortunately have my copy has like Pretty much everything, insert wise. Um, you have the the gorgeous album cover, uh, which is a collage and the play on the "Give Them Enough Rope." Uh, yeah, Clash uh, album cover. It's like a painting collage. It's I'm not sure what what exactly. She did a lot of collage work. Um, incredible stuff. Some of the best collage work I've ever seen. Some of my favorite stuff. Um, it has the Obi strip. With the beta mm-hmm. brands, beta brands, beta brands over and over and over again on the front side. And then there's like, you know, um, all of the like hype stuff on the back. There's a great little capitalism is killing music um, play on the uh, the tape with the skull and bra- crossbones with the tape cassette head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just full color, just like tons of color on everything. Full printed inserts, a uh, full printed sleeve inside um uh, like the record sleeve with lyrics more artwork all the like mythos of the the sci-fi world like all of these like little dispatches and things just adding to the the um the narrative of it a pamphlet inside which is like a full multi-page booklet pamphlet like called unconventional warfare survival handbook so like playing on like your anarchist uh pamphlet kind of literature yeah does it have the 10 point program of the rock band beta brains in it not this maybe not i, I don't know about what's in the manual but i don't know if uh, i don't know if this is a flyer that was handed out but there's this little is this thing it's called the 10 point program to the rock band beta brains and it's got 10 points and it says number one sell your friends number two sell your children number three sell your culture Number four, negotiate all principles into non-existence. Number five, provide aid and comfort to colonizing elements. Number six, consume dog shit and enjoy it. Number seven, sabotage all relationships. Number eight, spread lies about yourself and others. Number nine, facilitate the growth of markets. Number 10, kill hope in young people. Like, it's just like this propagandized, like, put together, like, this whole packaging of, yeah. And and the new Beta Brains rock band would like to thank you in advance for upholding the status quo through assuming your historical place as duty-filled stewards of tradition. It is not without your 
tireless efforts and affirmations that these self-evident principles gain strength, precluding any and all possibility of a future, past or present, all the while preserving the sanctity of the marketplace and facilitating the lucrative flow of capital. You'll be rewarded handsomely for your new betrayals. Signed, the new Bader Brains rock band. (laughs) So, yeah, just a very, very, very anti-capitalist approach which is very similar to the frodus way because like frodus also had like frodus conglomerate international and like yeah. being like this corporation that was like yeah sell out all your beliefs and yeah my uh lots of like mind control and you know commercial you know corporate espionage uh, you just just very anti-corporate through the through the play acting like a mock version of an evil corporation or you know this, which is fun and playful and silly and like he's not macho and masculine and tough and doesn't fit hardcore at all (laughs) in in how goofy and silly it is but like has genuinely good politics and message behind it and intention and and like is genuinely like lived out and carried out and acted upon and by the people in the band like they're in I, I know at least in in Sarah Kirsch's case is like heavily involved with like Bay Area, you know, organizing. But and uh, like and I love that this is a band that is not on streaming. This is a band yeah. that's not you can't stream their music. It was never intended to sell well at all. Right. If sell out at all. They probably did pretty small pressings, but they had copies for a long time. Clean Plate definitely had a box of these LPs for a long time. They weren't a long lived band and they put so much effort into packaging an LP for something that's not going to sell the what? cost on this thing. Oh yeah. I mean, it I'm, would have been cheaper, you know, this time period getting records pressed wasn't that expensive, but any of the packaging still is like pretty high cost to go to all of that effort to, to, have the presentation be such an important part of the music. It, it's a whole art piece, and it's so contrary to, kind of contrary to the time period of heavy music that we're in, of hardcore and being like merch machines and just like churning shit out and like making tons of money, um, <clears throat> relatively speaking. But I I looked up some live footage too from around this time period and I found like a set at Gilman Street in 2007 and so like the band is they're wearing costumes so like everything on yeah. the stage is like this thought out thing too so like they, in this set they're wearing like hard hats and they have like medical face masks and like they're wearing all white uniforms they got bandanas around their necks uh they've got like a a video being projected on like a sheet behind them so like they've got like costumes which a lot of her projects did have costumes especially the later stuff. Um, then in, there's another set in 2008. And so like it, it starts with like a bunch of people getting up on stage wearing ski masks and like passing out pamphlets. Maybe that 10 point thing is like them is that where that comes from, but like they're passing out all these pamphlets and then they, those people all leave the stage and then the band comes up and they are wearing, they're also wearing costumes again and they're wearing these. I think they're supposed to be like Japanese militant, costumes and they're like these like military kind of uh clothes but they're tiger striped like they're blue and tiger striped and like they're wearing like the military hats so like it's definitely like militia looking garb and then they're still wearing like the medical face mask i think some are wearing like bandanas up instead which in 2008 it's like now that we've lived through a pandemic it's like jesus (laughs) they were very prescient and uh there's some lyrics on here too where i'm like this is still very thing a thing today, um, which we'll get into later. But so, yeah, every single thing about this band is thought about, constructed, put forward. And maybe the costumes aren't the best looking costumes. And like the sheet on the wall with like the projector wasn't like the coolest looking thing either. But it was still very much like a DIY put together. You know, this is on a budget. You know, this is what we had around the house type thing. They did. um yeah, please inform the captain did kind of like the hard hat and scheme or face covering thing too. Very Devo influenced, and, and I think like with a lot of her bands, there's there's a similarity and like a connection to like uh, the Locust, you know, being a, a being a costume band and being a similar uh, similar style of music too. But which you know, with uh, a Swing Kids connection, yeah, um, 
does also make a lot of sense too. But I did. I Mother Country motherfuckers. I think they did the. Um, what was their costume? They had a. They were masks, like Halloween masks of some kind. I think. Like they look kind of like Reagan masks. I don't know if they were, but. Or were they like those clear ones with like the painted like cheeks and eyes? I've seen footage. They're definitely like wearing masks and costumes. Uh, I can't find pictures of that band. They did. No, they did the. At least at one point they did the like the Warhol wigs <laughs> and like black sweaters and white pants. Like they all wore the same like Andy Warhol outfit. <laughs> but like with I think they did the weird rubber mat face mask thing too, which. Oh, that, that I think it was just face paint, maybe, or like a latex mask. So with this band, like the music is just badass. It's just this loud, fast, hard hitting like music. There are tracks on here that I'm just like, fuck yeah. Like Year Zero being the like first real hardcore song with like the autopsy begins. And then it's like <laughs> pick straight pick scrapes that sound like bullets, like whizzing by like it sounds like. Like ricocheting bullets, but it's like I think it's pick scrapes. Like yeah, it's got those the metal emo... picks probably. Yeah, yeah. And then there's like songs like "Bring Us the Head of Marco Werman." It's another like a really chaotic track. "Be Seeing You at Camp Delta" is this just awesome song, you know, which like ends with the "We Are Bait Our Brains" like part of the song. And "Pulgasari" is this really fun song that probably fits the most in like the fuel style. And then like the title, the name the band na- name track, the Bader brains final track that ends with the, like we must fight day and night to destroy the United States of America. Like chant, I guess is how you would describe that. That is like five star, just like incredible moment, you know, on the record. Like that song is incredible, but the, and that, like the samples like play into like some of the themes too, of the, of the lyrics and like, like boiling at the gates is like the one that's got like the, what's going on princess like that one with like the it's like the revolution is coming and he's like i gotta get out of here you know (laughs) some one of my favorite moments that my favorite collage sample line is the the illusion that you're a boss to you yeah line and not what you really are a flunky yeah um and and the end, yeah, the end of Bader Brains, that's it's fucking incredible. Like, give back the brains, give back the fucking brains line. We must fight day and night. But, like, they, it, she had these incredible, like, political anthem chorus, like, kind of lyrics that she would write. But she had these others, like, Bader Brains, that song starts, uh, vampire attacks on the Hux were staged. In Stamheim, it's known the suicides were faked. Kansan or Abu Ghraib, it's all the same. Your mind is a pickled jar whisked away. <laughs> incredible polit- political lyrics like so savvy and so like not holding back just like fuck america <laughs> <laughs> fuck empire fuck colonialism like it's just so for the throat every single time I, some of my favorite hardcore lyrics political lyrics like really just incendiary this so like this is the kind of music that i'm like i gotta read the lyrics i gotta read the lyrics and then like it's also the kind of lyrics that i'm like well i look up what that means i gotta look up what <laughs> that is like i don't know what this is referring to so i gotta figure out what's going on so it literally starts with their name bader brains is this direct reference to andreas bader who is the one half of the bader meinhof group the meinhof uh Ulrich Meinhof. The group was actually called the Red Army Faction. They were a militant, far left West German group, uh, very um, uh, politically violent. I guess is how you would describe it. Like they were definitely like causing l- very serious <laughs> damage to uh, right wing, you know, German. They describe themselves as a communist, anti imperialist, urban guerrilla group. So like it's definitely like. Armed, res- they were an armed resistance, a militant armed resistance to uh, the the fascist state of uh, Germany. And one of the things about them is when they were arrested, they were all put in this prison, and they were, according to the state, committed suicide. All the members committed suicide in prison. Uh, one of them being like shooting Bader or Andreas Bader shot himself in the back of in the back of his head so that the bullet came out through his forehead. And it was just like, you 
the angle that they were describing and is like diagrammed or whatever you can't shoot yourself in the head that way so it's very <laughs> and there were like also bullets in the walls around andreas and, and so it was very much obviously like they're politically executed in prison is what it was yeah. and so they the, all their brains were like examined by the the medical state at the time and bader bader's brains disappear and go missing because they're like oh, we shot that guy in the head so <laughs> we got to make this his brains disappear so that is what the name bader brains is referring to it's Andreas Bader's brains after he was most likely politically assassinated while in prison. And so that's why I think give back the fucking brains is like a big line in the song Bader brains. And so it's just like, this is fucking wild. And so it just, it just keeps going from there. So like, that's like the name of the band. And then like the main things about that song, I'll mention it. The hooks that are mentioned in that song, they were a Filipino communist guerrilla movement. They mentioned Stamheim prison. This is the prison where the uh, Red Army faction was held and Andreas Bader was probably shot during. Um, that's the song references Abu Grabe, which was the site of the uh, prison torture uh, that America yeah. was doing. That song also mentions Fort Diederich, which is where biological weapons were studied in the United States. So, like, it's very much a the whole song is just like talking about political figures being tortured and held. But then, like, other songs, too. Like, I think the the Young Tigers is most likely a reference to the 1969 German film, The Young Tigers of Hong Kong. Uh, it's in which is, like, the premise of that movie is, like, these, like, rich people setting up clubs that then lead to brainwashing and human trafficking. And, like, it fits, like, the timeline of, like, the type of samples that we're going with. So it, that's probably what The Young Tigers is referring to specifically. I did look up Marco Werman because, like, who's Marco Werman? Marco Werman is a public radio host. Uh, who worked like for NPR and like the world, the world has like the show that he worked for, for like public radio. But in 2006, like went to Libya and made like a documentary about like Libyan culture in general. And I think it's, I think that Marco Werman is like the subject of some um, negative feelings. They're like, there's lines about like drinking wine or something. And basically like, you're just going there to like, I'm traveling the world to like show off like my I don't know. There's some there's there's a subtext there that I don't know that's not exactly like explicitly like laid out in that song, but they definitely have problems with Marco Werman going to Libya. Body of the King, that's got references to Vietnam and Iraq, so that feels like a very like anti-war song, anti-military song. Camp Delta, that was in Guantanamo. And that song also mentions dirty bombs, which were, you know, a big fear in the post 9/11 America. And then it mentions Asian flu in that song and it's probably specifically referring to the 50s influenza pandemic but also mm. could be like a bird flu and SARS reference this is around that same time period where that stuff was popping up here yeah um Pulgasari the song has references to Mahdi which is an Islamic figure said to bring about the end times it also mentions the golem which is like a Jewish folk monster meant to like out of clay to like protect and then Pulgasari is a Korean folk monster who eats metal but there's also a monster movie called Pulgasari, which was made by one of the directors that Kim Jong Il kidnapped from South Korea. And I think they were from South Korea and like forced them to make movies for North Korea. Like there's like I, there's like a really long like YouTube documentary video about it. that just like talks about those the directors who were kidnapped by Kim Jong Il and the, and the movies they were forced to make. And they were forced to make a Pulgasari like Godzilla knockoff movie. And then just like, yeah, it, this whole record is just full of these like dense references to things that like, if you were like the most knowledgeable leftist person, you might be like, Oh shit. Oh wow. Oh wow. <laughs> you, you would catch all that stuff. But like, maybe you're like us. I assume these lyrics are pretty well written out. So I'm assuming there's liner notes in the record that like you can read every, every lyric. This would be the kind of thing that I would want. Like if, if I'm Sarah Kirsch, I want these lyrics to be able to be read so that if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can then at least like know what I'm saying to look up what it means. You know, let me go grab my insert and see what it says on there. Cause there's so much shit written on that thing. Yeah. There's like tons of writing on that thing. Oh, it's like looking at it. There's so much <laughs> printing on here. Bring us the head of Marco Werman, uh, cable news network and national public radio have acknowledged that eight members of the U S army fourth psychological operations group, served as interns in their news division and other areas. 
PSYOPs is a highly specialized unit of the military whose personnel are trained in the production and dissemination of U.S. government propaganda, including on television and radio programs. A total of five PSYOPs sergeants were assigned to CNN's Atlanta headquarters. These included two at the Southeast Bureau, two at CNN Radio, and one at the Satellite Department. Three PSYOPs personnel also worked at the Washington, D.C. headquarters of NPR, a publicly funded radio network. (laughs) So, yeah, she's basically going... NPR is fucking psyops, which in 2006 saying that like so the okay the, this, lib, the very liberal NPR of 2006 and which th- there's the line uh throwing dutifully lobbing softballs at Rand Corporation flunkies it's like yeah it's kind of like the pretend you know liberal it's the centrist liberal you know well we're gonna be hard on them yeah so like that. The stuff in this record, it's just like, is this predicting the future? And really, it's just like, this is what capitalism does, the type of things that capitalism is going to repeat over and over again. So, like, this is referring to Iraq and, like, the war going on there and basically America just being like, yeah, we were attacked by uh, Osama bin Laden. So we're going to do a bomb and destabilize an entire, you know, other country that had nothing to do with anything. And so seems like she's definitely like coming for like the NPR-ness of just like you're just so centrist middle of the road because like so much of like the Democratic Party like voted to like go to Iraq and like was like a pro-Iraq war stuff so seeing that now reflect in 2023 when you're looking at what's happening in Israel and Palestine and Gaza specifically and you're just like this is the exact same thing that happened already you know in right after 9-11 for the U.S., and it's just now Israel's doing the exact same thing, and America's being complacent and contributing to it and funding and all that kind of stuff. So it's just like this, reading it this year, after the stuff that's happened this year, it's just like, Jesus Christ. Like, it's just like, it's this never-ending cycle of just like the same. Like, I know that if she was still alive today, she would be making music probably right now that's specifically like attacking what's happening again. So it's like that far-left radical approach to anti-capitalism and just like ah just brilliant stuff just like I, so i really like the the detail like it's not yeah it's tying all of these references very it's almost doctoral level like mm-hmm. leftist like she's she's so entrenched in all of this information i'm just like and piecing all of these things together and and making the connections and it's it's not just it's not slogany. I mean, it kind of plays with that slogany ness, but then but it's like kind of oblique too. like it's it has the language of a pamphlet. But the things that are written as if they would have been on the front of a pamphlet are so oblique and like, what are you what are you referencing? What are the young tigers? What are, what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> and then you, you have to like dig a little deeper and like you can catch some things you'll catch and you're like, Oh, I know what that's a reference to. And you start to piece things together and you start to dig and you start and you dig more. And I mean, if you have the LP, like, yeah, you have an explanation for literally every song on here. So yeah, there's, there's just so much, um, really, really an incredible artist. I mean, certainly time consuming to make this kind of work. So I, you know, she wouldn't likely have a, very high output right now but right right, yeah i mean i could see like it just being like well we're gonna do beta brain stuff now like maybe like because it feels timing wise would make sense to like play some of that beta brain stuff but i also feel like she would have made like three more bands in the meantime like she was doing mother country motherfuckers but like she probably would have started another band like 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 two years later and done something there she was only 42 years old and it's funny i've heard people talking about like do you remember when Trump was elected and there was like this like weird statement that people were saying online a lot about like, oh, well, at least political, at least political music will be good again or something like that. Like or punk music will get real political again. Like there's definitely like those kind of comments being made. Yeah. And then I've also heard in recent like year in recent, like maybe over the last year, like one of the podcasts I listen to pretty regularly where they're like when everybody said punk was going to be, you know, controversial and like going after politics again and being like protest music again it didn't happen and my big takeaway was well you just weren't listening to the right stuff because 
Uh, if you were listening to any hardcore band fronted by a non cis het white male, uh, you were getting supremely politically and socially conscious like protest music. Like, go read Body Farms lyrics. Like, you're just you're not listening to the same kind of stuff now. Just because yeah. the industry isn't gonna prop that kind of stuff up anymore. But yeah, I mean, and those you know those people are still making political. Yeah, <laughs> but they're not complacent now that we have a Democrat president. My point being is that I would have loved to have seen what she would have written over the last couple of years, like what Sarah Kirsch would have written, what she would have put together, what she probably would have been like doing online. I don't know what kind of like non-musical things she did for a living. I don't know. I don't know what she was. I don't know if this is all just like self-taught stuff or if she actually was like Dan Yemen and like had like, <laughs> you know, like a doctorate or something. I don't I don't know exactly like what her professional background was outside of music unless she was just like purely just like co-ops all the time or that kind of work but mutual aid um yeah she did all most of the writing is just about her bands in terms of like she's known for but nate powell of um he's the comic artist graphic novelist artist uh writer he did the like the march series with john lewis like those are his most famous things he was in a band called sufi nun nun squad and like he ran he had a record label too that that i can't remember what the label was called but they put out like the uh the pre-lucera red 40 compilation on their label because he was nate powell's from arkansas originally so he was tied in with them but with sufi nun squad like he became really close friends with sarah kirsch and so like they like toured together and like were friends and whenever they had the chance they would you know see each other and talk so like he wrote this really awesome piece about sarah when she passed away in 2012 and he kind of is very much in line with a lot of that like same approaches and beliefs to like stuff like that and it shows in his work too like the stuff with john lewis like it's political you know comic books that's like some of the most famous thing he's ever done so yeah there's this there is this the thread still kind of lives on it continues on and yeah it's just truly like genius level stuff like i think beta brains is probably it's the last project she did where she was like alive while completing every single step of it because i don't i don't new era hope colonialism which is the ep after came out in 2012 which is the same year she died i don't know what what month that came out in i don't know how involved she was in with that release and packaging if she was sick at the time i could see maybe not being like super duper involved in that side of things uh she had um she had a medical condition that was like basically like in her blood it's like a genetic yeah. mutation in her blood that like Cause like lymphoma and a specific cancer. anemia. I don't mm-hmm. know exactly what it, name it was. It's like a form of anemia that causes cancer was essentially what it was. Yeah. So like she was, she was diagnosed with that. Like she was trans as well. And I think it was like, she came out as trans and then like not long after she came out, she was also diagnosed with this form of anemia. So like she didn't even really get to live like that long of a life, like out as, you know, you know, her, her truly, preferred you know gender and everything like that so she may have been like open with some family and friends prior to that but publicly it wasn't like that long of a life so like even then like i feel like she's so interesting because like so much of her lyrics and content is so much it's just like leftist politics is like the main thing but then like i wonder too like if her personal like you know gender identity stuff would have started to play more of a role lyrically too like i don't know we never know really what what else we would have gotten from her creatively and <clears throat> made brains to feel us like the like the last piece where she was like, I wrote it, explanations for every single song <laughs> on here. There's so much writing and content all over this stuff, thought and everything put behind it. It's just like, yeah, like I said, is it like the peak? Like, is it the is it the pinnacle of her like creative output? Like, is that like, I don't know. I don't know what she musically. I don't know what was necessarily her favorite thing that she'd ever done, but. Yeah, I could see Beta Brains being just kind of like... Well, she seemed like someone who was constantly looking for it. I mean, always moving on. Like, this is... Beta Brains is her and a drummer, ultimately. Yeah. Like, but she's always changing the name. Like, you know, it was always a different band. It was always a new project. And, like, they're very... Like, Mother Country Motherfuckers is very of a piece with Beta Brains. And, but there's something for is I would love to know, but... Is it just like, well, I'm working with someone else on this, so it's a different band. And yeah, like that's just like I'm never going to get attached to 
a band name as a brand or anything to like I've got to maintain a, a synchronicity and a recognizable you know whatever but yeah yeah clearly she never cared about that because <laughs> out of the num- number of bands that she was involved with you know and yeah it's, it was creative collaboration it was like who am I working with this time like she had some people that she worked with on different projects like they would show up you know, in different groups over years. Like I think one of her, one of her fuel co- co-members was like also in torches to Rome maybe, or something like that. Like people would just, she would come and go with different people. So it's like whatever, like court, you know, whatever, like gr- cord, you know, um, what was the word I'm thinking of? Like, um, just like the group of, that she's working with. It's like, all right, this group is now this band. Like this is, this is please inform the captain, you know? Oh, the, Oh, we're done. Cool. This one's beta brains now. Like it's just like whatever configuration of people that she's working with is a new project, you know. And maybe this is just the one that was just like the most just her, as far as like Jose was involved in the in the as the drummer and was also in Bread or Circuits, Bread and Circuits. But she's the vocalist, she's the guitarist in this band, so like she's doing the lyrics, she's doing the liner notes, she's doing everything. So it's probably the most purest form of just her with like less output from other people than some of the other projects but i don't know it's fucking awesome it's so good every project she did was great like there's not a bad record that she's on like i think the weakest thing she ever did was that like silver bearings band which yeah. was like it's like a live recording only and it's like a split with moss icon like that's that's it like that's all we have for that band that's the weakest thing and it's just because it wasn't like studio recorded to me so or like maybe like Colbum. Just because I don't think that was specifically her project. She was just in the group. But yeah. Just uh, so good. What do we rate? What do you, you give it a rating? Like what? Uh, five stars? Like what? Yeah. I mean, it's literally perfect. Um, <laughs> New Era Hope Colony is literally a perfect rec- record as well. Uh, it's an E. It's a, so funny. Complete Unfinished Works. Considered an LP. Um, 10 tracks. 22 minutes did we say 20 yeah like 21 plus and some change uh new era new era hope colony considered an ep i guess nine tracks is what makes it an ep (laughs) 20 minutes long yeah (laughs) like a minute shorter (laughs) yeah just yeah it's it's a five star it's five star like i i could i could defend that if someone wanted to come like i'd have an answer for everything if you tried to take this record (laughs) down i'm just I listen to it and I have no complaints. I listen to this and I like want to fucking mosh and throw around the apartment and like fight someone and <laughs> start a band and like uh, every year, like every it's every time this year I listen to a, a, at least one of her records and I'm like, man, I want to do a I want to do a Bader Brains <laughs> band. I want to do a Bread and Circuits. I want to. I don't have time for that. <laughs> it can be digital <laughs> are you a drummer do you like these records i will send you riffs <laughs> look just reach out to dan yemen we know dan yemen is like a massive sarah kirsch fan just be like look yeah. i want to do this you want to get in here someone needs to carry on the legacy of this which i mean this is a, this is a good opportunity to talk about this her the design work on her records is a Di- is a direct influence on all the collage work that I do. Like probably the number one reason that I do my little phone overlay digital collages. I like, I just, I'm just like part anxiety part. I want to do that kind of artwork. I just love looking at it. There's so much great material to just smash together. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's all. Yeah. I think that'll do it. So thank you all so so much for listening uh definitely went a lot longer than i thought we would on this topic uh it's funny i was definitely like going into this i was like i don't have very many notes like i don't i don't i don't know what i'm gonna really say and then it was just like i never paused i feel like we didn't stop at all like no <laughs> like, like what else what else none of, none of that it was definitely i've definitely like had bigger records where i was like what else do you want to say about this uh you know but no no that was not what this this is not the case with this one. So thank you all so much for listening. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you can follow us on all the social medias at punk Lotto pod. You name it. We got it at punk Lotto pod. 
punkletterpod gmail.com and our voicemail line 202-688-PUNK. Start getting those best of 2023 voicemails ready. Start thinking about your lists. Leave us messages and let us know what your favorite albums of the year were. So love to play those on the show at the end of the year. The voicemails are some of my favorite stuff that we get. So start thinking about what you're going to say and calling in and leaving some messages. But uh, yeah, not sure what we're going to do next week. It'll probably be my turn to choose something and then... uh, We'll start thinking about year end and Christmas content. So that's it for now. Thank you all so much. We'll talk to you later. To order punk, call the number on your screen. Rush delivery is available. Remember, this special offer is not sold in stores.